Hi, my name is Mike. I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm in the ICU here with you today and going to talk about setup of non-invasive ventilation. Uh, this is one of the popular models we have here in the area and it's a Philips V60, although there are a few different brands out there. Before we get started, we'll go ahead and hook our power up. It's electric power. We're going to plug it into a red plug so that it's on the backup generator in case the power goes out. We also need a 50 PSI gas source, so we have our quick connect here. We'll just go ahead and plug that into the wall, and then now we'll put our circuit together. So this is a circuit that goes with it. Uh, the important thing about non-invasive ventilation circuits is that they need to be smooth bore on the inside. If you use corrugated tubing, which is jagged on the inside or you know full, has the folds, it creates turbulent airflow and causes a lot of resistance, which will create uh, pressure in the circuit and you know, cause it to cycle off sooner. So you don't want that. You want the, the flow to be more smooth. So this circuit is made for this. Put a filter on here to hook to the inspiratory side. We're going to go ahead and put it on our patient outlet port. That's where the gas comes out. Then we're going to connect this little uh, pressure monitoring tubing right here. And that actually connects up here and that way it can measure uh, what it needs to measure at the airway. On non-invasive, you always need, because it's not got an exhalation valve internal and uh, it doesn't have two limb circuit or any kind of fancy exhalation valve, we actually just have a port here. And these are located in different places on different systems, but the point is with non-invasive, you always need an exhalation port. So when it's, uh, the system is pressurized with flow going through it, patient exhales, you want a place for the gas to vent out. So when they exhale their CO2, it actually goes out the port and they don't rebreathe it. Also, uh, it allows extra pressure to vent out. This is going to be uh, a pressure regulated system, which means that it's gonna to try to maintain certain pressures and so you have to have a place for some of the gas to leak out so that it can maintain the pressures. All right, go ahead and turn it on. Go through its little startup procedure. And you should always do a leak test. We're not gonna do that as part of today because it's different on different machines. So we have our non-invasive system set up plugged in, circuit on. Before we apply it to the patient's face, we need to go ahead and put our settings in. There's a few different modes in here on this particular machine, and there's pressure control, uh, CPAP, AVAPs. We're not gonna cover those right now. AVAPs and pressure control are covered in another YouTube video on my YouTube channel if you're interested in looking at those. But let's talk about the difference between CPAP and ST modes. CPAP is just one level of pressure. It's continuous positive airway pressure, it just holds one baseline pressure. The patient can breathe in and out as they wish, all spontaneous breathing. But even after they exhale, there is a baseline pressure that's held in there. And what we get out of that is splint airways open for obstructive sleep apnea or floppy airways and premature airway closure in COPD and we do get a little bit of oxygenation out of it. So that's the advantage to CPAP. But again, that's one level of pressure. If we wanted to go ahead and do uh, two levels of pressure known as uh, bi-level or BiPAP, some people call it, it's a brand name, but there's two levels of pressure and now we have one baseline pressure. In this case, it's called EPAP. Now that's the baseline pressure, and that is actually the same as CPAP. It's, uh, and that is the same as PEEP, if you're familiar with PEEP on a ventilator. So it, EPAP, CPAP, and PEEP are functionally all exactly the same. It just changes names according to what application you're on. If you're on a ventilator with a, a set rate, then it's called PEEP, that baseline pressure. If you're just using one pressure mode, one pressure, that is CPAP. 
But when you go to the two pressure mode, which is bi-level or a BiPAP, then you have two pressures. You have your baseline, and now the name changes to EPAP, which is expiratory positive airway pressure. And we're gonna go ahead and set that at five. And again, that's our, our baseline for oxygenation, holds airways open. It's great for COPD, asthmatics. Uh, anytime you need to oxygenate your patient, you're gonna work with the EPAP level. You don't really wanna go lower than four or five because you want to leave some baseline pressure in the circuit at all times because otherwise uh, it doesn't blow the CO2 out of the circuit and the patient ends up rebreathing their CO2. So we have that baseline pressure in this case of five, but in the bi-level mode, what's gonna happen when they go to take in a breath, it's gonna sense that and it's gonna kick to the higher pressure, which is IPAP. And let's just go ahead and put that at 10 just for the sake of a nice even number there. The settings are according to the patient's needs. Now that IPAP, that's inspiratory positive airway pressure. And so you have your baseline of five. When the patient goes to take in a breath, it's gonna to kick to that higher level of 10. And what that does is gives them a little inspiratory boost, which should help make their tidal volumes a little bit larger. So the IPAP is designed to improve the tidal volumes on patient breaths. Still spontaneous breaths, still the patient is in control, but it does influence the tidal volume a little bit. So we have our baseline of five, kicks up to 10 on inspiration, then when they go to exhale, it kicks back down to five. And so we have a pressure difference of five there. So actually when they go to take in a breath, it's gonna go from five up to 10. So it's actually a pressure boost of five. Now in ST mode, ST stands for spontaneous timed. They're all spontaneous breaths, but if the patient, if their rate slows down to where they're not triggering as many breaths as you would like them to, you can actually do timed switches from EPAP to IPAP. In this case, it's 20. So if the patient doesn't trigger it on their own, then it's gonna switch from EPAP to IPAP 20 times a minute in this case, which is a little high, but uh, that is for great for when you just wanna kind of trigger them into, into a breath. This is not to be used as a ventilator. It doesn't guarantee a, you know, a volume. It's not a controlled breath. It just kicks from EPAP to IPAP. It's really great for uh, central sleep apnea. Then we have, uh, just kicked out of the menu there, but that's okay. Inspiratory time, which in this case is one second, usually 0.8 to 1.2 is reasonable. And we have our FiO2, and that's just the, how much oxygen they're getting. Nice thing about using 50 PSI uh, gas instead of entrained room air is we can actually get 100% out of this. So uh, rise, not in the scope of what we'll talk about today, uh, but because we're just hitting the, the basics here. Then we have alarms we can set and we're ready to go. As on ventilators, there's always a set portion and then there's what the patient's actually doing. So this isn't actually hooked to a patient. I actually have my thumb over the end of it. So all of these are timed breaths. Let's see if I can, there we go. I, I just did a couple of lift my thumb off to simulate a spontaneous breath and you can see spontaneous and then if I wait, there's a timed. This is the total rate. We have a set rate down here, total rate up here. That's the exhaled tidal volume. Minute ventilation, the pressure, which 14, it's set at 14, that's what it should be. The patient trigger percent, that's the percentage of the, all the breaths that are triggered by the patient. If I don't trigger breaths eventually, that'll keep dropping. A little bit of a, if there's a little bit of a leak, let me see if I can simulate that. So a little bit of a leak, you can tell how much it is. Different machines will allow for different amounts of leak. Uh, this particular one allows for a pretty good, pretty good leak. Um, 
And then, so you might have leaks for things like beards, uh, tubes coming out of the nose that have to go you know, where the mask would seal. Uh, if somebody has a face that's shaped such that the mask doesn't seal properly, you might get a little bit of a leak, and so this will make up for it up to a certain point. The TI to T-tote, that's the inspiratory time percentage of the total cycle time. Uh, it should be around 33%, which means one part inspiratory time to two parts exhalation time, which is pretty normal. And with that, we are ready to apply it to our patient. Okay, so we've got our setup ready. We've got it plugged into the wall. We've got our circuit put together. We have our settings in, and now we're ready to put it on our patient. So I have Topanga here with me, and she's agreed to do a mask fitting. And so there's different types of masks available on the market. There's nasal pillows that just fit up in the nose. There's a nasal mask, which just fits over the nose. There's a full face mask, which fits over the mouth and nose. And then there's a total face mask that fits around the perimeter of the whole face. That's great for people who are claustrophobic, who wear glasses, or to give them a wider field of vision. Those are nice. Today we're going to use the full face mask that covers the mouth and nose. That's what we use here uh, very frequently. It's great for hospital use. So when you do a mask, you have to size the mask. And that specifically has to do with the facial features. So where you want it on the top is in the dip at the top of the nose and the dip underneath the bottom lip with the mouth slightly open because that's how when we're at rest we just kind of are that way with the mouth slightly open. So I'm going to put the sizing guide here at the top of the nose. Her mouth is slightly open and then the dip it tells me she's got a is going to use a small mask. So here's the mask we're going to use. Very easy to hook to the circuit. You just slide it up in there and we're good to go. What we're not going to cover today is getting people to wear this. This can be frightening, a little bit uncomfortable, a little hard to get used to for people at first. So uh, sometimes it requires a little bit of education, a little bit of working with people, explaining to them. And it also requires that you don't just walk up and strap it to their head right away because that can be a little scary and ner uh, unnerving for people. So I usually try to just put it up to their face, let them get used to it a little bit. Sometimes I let them hold it so they have control over if they take it away. And then once they appear to be okay with it, I'll start strapping it down onto their, uh, the headgear onto their head. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this on her face. And this particular machine will start as soon as it senses her breathing in, which is a nice feature. And so we're just gonna pull this down I usually apologize for having my fingers in their face for at first. There we go. Alright, now it's on and she's doing fine with it. So now I'm just going to kind of adjust it, make sure it's pulled down, not pinching her ears. And I don't want it too tight or too loose, so I'll usually just go ahead and undo both and let it kind of seat and then pull them down on evenly on each side. If you only do one at a time, you're gonna pull the mask to either side and then it increases the risk for leaks and being uncomfortable. And then the top actually looks pretty good, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that one as well just to show you. Again, just kind of cinching them both down together. And then this one has one on top as well that we're gonna go ahead and pull so that it's snug. Loose. Does that feel okay? Next thing to do is make sure it's not leaking and not too tight. So usually if their eyes are fluttering around, it means there's some air blowing in it, in their eyes. But I'll ask, are, is it blowing in your eyes at all? No. And then I'll usually take my hands and kind of feel around here to see if there's any air blowing out and there's not. And then I can also look at the leak, which is minimal. A little bit of leak, uh, it reads out on the, on the screen. A little bit of leak is totally fine. The machine will make up for that. Uh, you'll get leaks with tubes and you know coming out the nose or beards or, or faces that are shaped such that it's hard to seal. But uh, she looks comfortable. Does that feel okay? And she's ready to go.